topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Who is January Jones? She is not a young, beautiful, talented actress on Mad Men. She is not an older, gorgeous, exotic dancer from the Johnny Carson Show. She is an author, and she wrote, Thou Shall Not Wine, The Eleventh Commandment, that reached number one at Amazon.com. She is a reality TV golf personality with World High Stakes Golf televised on HDNet. She is a humorist and winologist expert. She is your featured host today on January Jones Sharing Success Stories. So sit back, relax, and get ready to laugh and listen to Ms. Jones with her eclectic roster of guests as you learn life's lessons. These stories plus sharing equals success. Welcome and remember, beware. Because you are entering the no-whining world of January Jones. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Isn't this holiday season the most magical time of the year? I'd like to welcome you to our podcast today. As many of you know, I'm trying out a new brand. I'm the Glitter Granny Hat Lady. It occurred to me that we all, during our lifetime, wear many hats. We change our hats every day. Wife, mother, grandmother, friend, worker, companion, you name it. It's a hat for all of us. So I'm trying a different color hat each week. And this week I put on a gold hat. Well, because we're going to be celebrating New Year's Eve soon and the beginning of a new year. As you know, my mantra is to ask good questions in order to get good answers. So now for my listeners, let me ask you a question. Are you ready to discover the number one way to go from self-loathing to self-love. Are you ready to discover the number one way to to befriend yourself and along the way, boost your body image? Do you wanna get unstuck and develop the energy to make your next chapter your best chapter in your life? Tell me, Are you looking for a roadmap that will help you become the woman or person you want to be as fast as possible without confusion, without frustration? Would you like to rock your midlife? (laughs) Well, I'd like to rock any life. (laughs) Now today, you can meet a midlife whisperer. This is a new one for me. I've heard about horse whisperer, but this is a midlife whisperer. If you can answer yes or maybe to any of these questions, then you are in the right place. And I'd like to welcome you to January Jones sharing success stories. Now it's time to rest, relax, get some wine, get some cheese, sit down and listen to our podcast. Let me tell you about my guest today. If you want to have a happy new year, she tells us to start ditching resolutions in favor of real solutions. My guest today is a psychologist, dietitian, nutritionist, and board certified health and wellness coach. Make it a happy no year. She'll advise people to say no to habits, behaviors, and relationships that drain them. And yes, to more of the things that bring them joy. It's my pleasure to welcome to the show today, Dr. Ellen Albertson. Hello, Dr. Ellen. How are you today? I am great, January. So good to see you. And that gold hat is very uh, pseudo. I love it. I love this idea of new hats for every show. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to wear a different hat. Also, I wanted to show off a lovely necklace that one of my children gave me for Christmas this year. So I decided to wear it today and share Beautiful. it with everyone. <laughs> lovely. You know, we talk, we, I was reading your resume and you talk about how our brain is flooded with uh, feel good hormones. And then we are less likely to pour another glass of wine or to start whining and then to try to have a threesome with Ben and Jerry's to feel good. But you have some answers or some things people can do differently, don't you? Yeah, I think the first thing to do is, you know, as we're looking at the new year, everyone is always thinking about resolutions, right? And resolutions, the research really shows that not only they don't work, they also don't make you feel very good. They don't help you manifest what you want because resolutions are all about fixing something that's broken. I mean, I, you know, as a dietitian, I've been a dietitian for 30 years. And it's always like, I want to lose weight. I want to get in shape. I want to get out of debt. But you're, you're trying to fix something that's wrong. Your brain doesn't know the difference between, okay, I want to do this thing around, you know, weight and it hears loss and it hears weight or it hears debt. So what you want to do is you want to ditch the resolutions because the research shows that most people give them up but within two weeks, you know, 90% of us have gone back to our old ways. And instead you want to start thinking about setting intentions, which okay. are much more powerful and empowering. So an intention, you know, we use the weight loss example, instead of I'm going to lose weight this year, I'm finally going to get in shape. You have an intention, like I'm going to take incredible you know, charge of my health. I'm going to take fantastic care of myself. I want to feel energetic. I want to feel joyful and confident. It's about how you want to feel the good things you want to do for yourself. So with the finances, instead of, I want to get out of debt, which I hear from people all the time, I want to live with abundance and gratitude. And I want to manifest things that I love in my life. So I'm actually helping people right now create intentions. And then once you sort of create retention, and initially it's a really good idea to kind of review last year. So we might want to review it and take a look at what worked, what didn't work, what did you learn, maybe even the last three years because COVID's really changed us, us right? And then from there, think about, okay, how do I want to feel? What do I want to create? It's The intentions is a much more positive, creative way going about transformation for the new year. You know, and speaking of the last three years, years uh, with this pandemic, uh, how did it affect you personally? How did it affect your career? Tell us about your pandemic experience, doctor. Yeah, well, um, gosh, there were some real positives. Um, initially, um, I was kind of locked down with someone I didn't want to be with. I was trying to break up a relationship. I was actually recently divorced and I had made the mistake of moving in with somebody. Yes, I learned what I'm teaching all the time about relationships, but I actually was fortunate enough um, in July of 2020 to meet an amazing man. So I fell in love, got engaged. So it sort of has been very exciting. Um, after my divorce to have met someone amazing. So that was great. In terms of career, I think for me so much was, um, it was about empowering people online. So doing my coaching online, I'd been doing a lot of public speaking and more some one-on-one -on -one work. And so I think, you know, professionally the pandemic offered opportunities to connect with people online. And fortunately, you know, we're continuing to do that. So I think it opens up the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, there were a lot of, you know, pros and cons. I think the isolation, I have I have um, elderly parents. So that was kind of a, a little scary to try to take care of them sure. and seeing them through all of this. But um, I'm happy that we're kind of turning the corner. But I think we've all changed so much. We've all had to spend a lot of time alone. So my, you know, my book came out, Rock Your Midlife, uh, November of 20, uh, 20, let's see, 2021. So okay. that was a great opportunity. I did a summit, I did the book. So I did a lot of things online to, uh, increase my influence. So I think it was, it has helped me with success of putting myself out there on a larger level. Well, it sounds like the pandemic pause has been an incredible experience for you personally and professionally. I'm glad to hear that. And so many of my guests have also shared the same uh, story that it took them. They had time to step back. They had time to reevaluate and reprogram. And I think in many ways it was good, uh, despite all the tragedy that so many people suffered. In, in a whole, uh, people are, I feel, are bouncing back. Don't you agree? 
I think they are, but I think we have to um, embrace what what has changed for us. Um, so I think, yeah, we're all kind of wanting to put that behind us. And I think everybody is really excited. It's just so nice to go out and be able yeah. to connect with people socially. I mean, I think that 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 was one of the hardest things of the pandemic. And as a psychologist, I know the importance of, of connection and how loneliness and not having that in, that one-on-one -on -one connection actually can be worse for you than, you know, eating cheeseburgers and having high cholesterol and smoking. <laughs> so it's really important. And I think that we always um, appreciate things when we kind of lose them. So I think that, Mm -hmm. losing that ability to connect with people that we love, having that isolation has made us really appreciate uh, the connection. I think travel's another thing for me. I have been traveling a lot recently. I've gone to Austin. I just got back from Quebec City. I'm planning a trip to Costa Rica. So I'm really trying to yeah. rock my own midlife and doing some <laughs> traveling, which has been lots of fun. So I think we all want to get back into, into traveling and doing those things on our bucket list. Well, right now we're going to take a short break. So if you are a whiner, or if you know someone who whines, do listen in. This is for you. Lately, there's a whining epidemic in our world. People are even whining about whining. Are you sick and tired of listening to everyone whining all the time? So was January Jones, the author of Thou Shall Not Whine, the 11th commandment that reached number one at Amazon.com. Ms. Jones based her book on a survey of the top 10 things that people whine about at all ages and all stages of life. January is a success coach that can tell you how to help others. When you buy Thou Shall Not Whine, the 11th commandment, you'll find out what people whine about and how to stop them from whining. This is the perfect gift book to give or get for any occasion. Thou Shall Not Wine was voted the best gift to be given anonymously for those special people in your life. Ms. Jones is an internationally known author in the style of Irma Bombeck, specializing in housewife humor with her book being published in Korea and China. You can find Thou Shall Not Wine at Amazon.com. Yes, Dr. Alan Albertson, who definitely is not a whiner because she is a winner and she is going to help make all of us winners in 2023. Now, Alan, before we go on any further, could you share your contact info with our listeners and tell them how they can contact you and how they can get your books? Sure. So the easiest way to find me is just Google the midlife whisperer.com. That's the midlife whisperer.com. I'm the only midlife whisperer on the planet. So I'm <laughs> easy to find and you can get my books there. I also have a podcast called rock your midlife. My book, like your wonderful book, which I will definitely get a hand ha handle on and also give it to those winders in my life. I love that, that idea to give it anonymously. Um, it's available at amazon.com and you can also go to your bookseller and request it. If you want to actually go to a brick and mortar uh, bookstore, and they can get it for you as well. And on, on Instagram, I am the underscore midlife underscore whisper. If you want to uh, connect with me, DM me, let me know how I can support you. Okay, wonderful, wonderful information to share. And okay, let's talk about the difference between joy and happiness. I love when you talk about more joy and less oi. <laughs> <laughs> and share with us what people can do to achieve more joy. Yeah. So the difference between joy and happiness, I'm so glad you asked that question is, you know, I think happiness is sort of on the exterior, right? So it's when things ha happen to us, you know, you think about somebody buying something that brings them happiness or somebody winning the lottery or, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know, you know, buying a new car or a new outfit, you know, you get this, this sort of this temporary like boost that you get, right? Yes. Joy to me is much more of an inside out. It's more of a, of a feeling that you can cultivate all the time. So I can, you know, intentionally find joy in so many things, big and small, you know, enjoying a beautiful meal, spending time with people that I love playing with my dog, taking a walk. So I feel like joy is joy is much more of an inside out intentional emotion that you can cultivate. Whereas happiness is like things happening to you that make oh. you feel you know happy and it's more temporary. I feel like joy is much, much deeper and it's, it has more of a spiritual component to it. And there are so many things that, you know, can really bring you joy. I would say the first thing, you know, like, which is something that I'm doing every day is set an intention 
Mm -hmm. to be more joyful. So again, this intention, this, this um, idea of what you intend to do. So just when you wake up in the morning, maybe before you get out of bed, before you, you know, even after you say some gratitudes, just say something like today, I intend to have more joy in my life. And then when you are actually doing things, bring that intention into it. So you can, here's a, here's a good example. You can go to the beach and I, I think you'll love this one January. You can go to the beach. You can say, oh, the beach is so crowded. It's so hot. It's so sandy. Or you can go to the beach and you can say, oh my gosh, there's sun and there's sand and there's water. And there's all of these wonderful people enjoying themselves. You can bring this attitude of joy when you change your perspective and you really decide to uh, just animate your whole life with this joyful attitude, things really start to shift because, you know, we see things not as they are, but as we are. So if you show up with this joyful attitude, you know, and you think about giving joy back and little daily things that you do that bring you joy and bringing more of those into your life, you very quickly see that you will be on this joyful path and really be so much healthier and happier. It, so joy does kind of make you happy, but I think it's it's much more powerful as a practice than just looking for things outside yourself to make you happy. Oh, for sure. And, you know, I think this goes back to uh, my generation, the power of positive thinking that we all try to put into our lives. And I really feel that during this pandemic pause, it was an opportunity for so many of us to step back and figure out what we really enjoy, what really gives us joy. And for so many of us, it was uh, a quiet time. It was an alone time. And that was unique because in such a busy world and everyone's, you know, got this device and that device and you go out to restaurants, people don't talk to each other. They, they have their phones uh, facing each other. And this pandemic uh, enabled us to uh, take a time out and I think your thoughts on seeking joy are so, so helpful. Now, how do you heal difficult emotions that you're dealing with? You know, the really tough ones. Yeah. So I teach something called self-compassion, which is learning to treat yourself the way you would a good friend. And so in oh. terms of difficult emotions, uh, the first thing is, is to name it. Well, I would say, first of all, it's okay to have difficult emotions. We are human. And so I think a lot of times we are taught like it's okay to have joy and happiness and gratitude and excitement, mm -hmm. but yeah. emotions like fear and sadness and frustration and grief, we're often taught to just stuff those and forget about them. So the first thing is to just give yourself permission to feel everything. Because the amazing thing is, is when you feel and you heal the difficult emotions, you feel more of the elevating emotions. When you sort of close off the difficult ones, you close off all your emotional spectrum. So you're sort of seeing more black and white instead of a rainbow of various emotions. So the first thing is to name it, you tame it. So when you name your emotion, when you say, this is sadness, this is fear, this is grief, this is overwhelm, this is confusion, what happens is you take that emotion from a more primitive part of your brain. If it's something like fear, it's called the amygdala, which is kind of our reptilian lizard brain. And you bring it into the big mammalian frontal cortex. As mammals, as humans, we have a huge brain, right? We have this very evolved brain. And so what it does is it unsticks it. Even now, if you're thinking, gosh, I've, I've been feeling sort of out of sorts. And I often share with people and reach out to me if you'd like it, this wheel of emotion to get really specific about what you are feeling. This is anxiety. If you, if you name it, it unsticks it. So after you name it, you tame it, you feel it, you heal it. So emotions are felt experiences in the body. We know we feel it. And if you think about things like heartache, right? We feel that in our chest when we're going through something, or maybe, you know, you're feeling butterflies in your stomach when you're feeling kind of fearful, or, you know, you, you've got a, you know, you're, something's in your throat. You, ha you can't speak your truth. Feeling it in your body helps you to really isolate that emotion. And then, and then what you can do is you can, um, actually soften, soothe, and allow it. So maybe rubbing, like putting your hand on your heart and just noticing like, wow, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. Instead of plowing forward and trying to ignore it, or like what a lot of my clients do is have that threesome with Ben and Jerry, because it's like, oh, I feel really overwhelmed right now. I don't know what to do, but just like, okay, this is overwhelmed or this is stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
okay, I'm going to, I'm going to just do a little soothing touch. I'm going to feel, notice where is that in my body and maybe massage. Maybe I need to massage my jaw. I've got to tighten my jaw or put my hand on my heart or one hand on the heart, one in the belly. What that does is it helps to generate what's called oxytocin, which is a neurotransmitter. It's the mammalian chemical of care and connection. So it's actually when, you know, a mother is nursing, the oxytocin is what is actually generated when we, you know, when we hug someone, when we even look at our pets and they look at us, we generate oxytocin, but we can generate it ourselves. If you're listening, you know, if you're feeling a little out of sorts, just give yourself a little hug. Notice what it feels. Your body doesn't know the difference between someone else hugging you or you hugging yourself. So mm -hmm. just being there, softening your body, soothing with a little touch, and then just allowing the emotion to be there. Because when you try to shove the emotion down or you do the, um, you know, stuffing it with food or alcohol or shopping, what happens is it's like that game of whack-a-mole, right? If you play that game with your grandkids where you hit the, you hit the moles and then they yeah. pop up again, right? So... <laughs> need to heal, you know, name it, you tame it, feel it, you heal it, allow your emotions to just be there and they'll come and go and you'll notice I feel better. Oh yeah. You know, that's, I'm writing this down. This is positively brilliant. Name it, tame it, learn how to hug yourself. That is a big uh, thing for 2023 20, that we should all do. And then if you feel you heal, um, these are such great uh, things that you're sharing with us. And uh, right now, I'm going to share two of my books. And this is about who killed Kennedy. You know, next year, 2023, it'll be 60 years since the Kennedy assassination. Very hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. There's a lot of going on around the possibilities of what happened. So... Okay, we're going to hear about that right now. Let me ask you a question. Are you still wondering who killed Kennedy? Over 50 years later, the assassination is still a mystery. It is unfinished business for our country. Now, get ready for a theory that you've never heard before, but will make more sense than any other conspiracy theory that you've ever heard in the past. January Jones speaks the unspeakable. In her book, Jackie, Ari, and Jack, The Tragic Love Triangle, Connecting Jackie and Aristotle Onassis Romantically Prior to JFK's Assassination. Did you know that Ari was Jackie's guest in the White House during the JFK funeral? He was the only non-family member who was invited by Jackie to stay there during the funeral. Aristotle Onassis was one of the wealthiest men in the world, with the means, the motive, and the money to order an assassination that was the perfect crime of the last century. Ari needed class, and Jackie needed cash. They were perfect for each other. Now, what is Camelot? It is but another tragic love triangle. Jackie, Ari, and Jack is available at JanuaryJones.com, Amazon.com, and Audiobooks.com, read by Ms. Jones. Welcome back with Dr. Ellen Albertson, the author of Rock Your Midlife. Now, you talked earlier about food and the connection with food and happiness. And I just noticed this last week that a movie just came out by uh, Brendan Fraser called The Whale. And I'm looking forward to seeing it. And obviously, it is obviously about a man dealing with obesity. And when we talk about food and happiness, uh, Food is a trigger for so many people, isn't it? Yes. Well, the the thing is that, you know, again, we are mammals, right? So we, um, and I'm reading a fascinating book now called Sapiens, which really talks about how we evolved. So we evolved hundreds of thousands of years ago when food was scarce. So if you came across a fig tree and the fig tree had tons of fruit on it, you ate as much as you could because you couldn't take the figs with you. People were nomadic. Uh -huh. So we still have the same body that human beings have not changed physiologically. We have the same body, the same brain that's really designed to move less and eat as much as you can. So here we are, you know, living in 2022, almost 2023, where there is something like 10,000 calories available for everybody every day. We have as much food as we want if, you know, if we're doing okay financially. So it's it's a very hard thing when we're designed 
to eat as much as we can because the only way you could carry the food is by turning it into body fat. So when I work with people, it's interesting, January, when people come to me, they're like, oh my gosh, Dr. Ellen, I can't stop eating. I'm having that, you know, wine and cheddar party or yeah. Netflix and potato chips or, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's. And so it's what the interesting thing is, is that we don't, even though I'm a dietitian, we don't start with addressing the diet, putting people on a diet because dieting actually does not work. The research really shows that, you know, yeah, when you diet, you get hungry and you have no control over your eating. It's the worst thing you can do. But what, what I do is I work with people with the emotions and I also work with people having more joy, more meaning, more purpose. And what I find with my clients is when they um, look forward to waking up in the morning when they, you know, are energized and excited about their day. They have meaning and purpose in their lives. Mm -hmm. By the end of the day, they don't want that, you know, glass of wine or that cheese. They're like, oh, my life feels really good. I don't need that in my life. So part of it is, you know, learning to really rock your midlife, feeling really good about yourself as we talked about in the last segment, learning to care for your emotions. So that when you feel like sad or lonely or tired, mm -hmm. you give yourself what you need. And it's not food. I tell people to remember the acronym HALT, which stands for hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. So if you're hungry, great. Hunger is a physiological signal that your body needs food. Generally, it doesn't go away unless we eat. You might feel lightheaded. You might have a little grumbling in your stomach. You might feel like your energy is low. Sorry. That's okay. Um, whereas, you know, A stands for angry or anxious. L is lonely and the T is tired. So if I'm feeling angry, anxious, if I'm lonely, if I'm tired, Having food is not going to take care of those issues. Yes, while I am eating the food, I'm distracted. And that's what people usually do is that they're feeling stressed out. And Lord knows we have reasons to be stressed. And so instead of generating oxytocin or finding other ways to uh, feel good and take care of their emotions, they go right to what's called dopamine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter. We've talked about being a lot of brain chemicals that is about reward. So what happens is if I'm feeling stressed out, if uh -huh. I'm feeling, you know, upset about something, if I go and I eat, my dopamine levels go up and I temporarily am distracted if I'm, and I'm feeling better. The problem is that once you're done with that bag of potato chips, yeah. you haven't addressed the issue that's bothering you. And on top of that, you might be feeling either not feeling so good physiologically, maybe you're feeling a little guilty because you're you know, wanting to take care of yourself. So when I work with people, I help them to really rock their midlife. I have a seven step system where I'm helping people to be authentic, to love themselves, to take care of their bodies, to empower themselves, to work on their relationships and to do things to feel good about who they are so that they don't go for the food. And on top of it, also making sure that you are well fed because the willpower is actually undermined by hunger. Again, a lot of research shows that when you are hungry, and just think about it, if I go to a restaurant and mm -hmm. I'm starving, mm -hmm. am I going to have the, you know, the healthy choice or am I going to go for the fried chicken dinner? Right. Absolutely. Same yeah. thing if you're in the grocery store. So, you know, going to the grocery store where you are full, where you have a list, where you're empowered. So there's so much you can do, but dieting is not the way to go. So if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to like go on that crazy crash diet. Don't do it. Set an intention. Reach out to me. I would be happy to support you in your desire to be healthy and well and happy and joyful in 2023. Oh, I love that. I love the acronym HALT. And I love that your book has seven steps, seven things that people can do before they eat. And that's such a good suggestion to not be hungry when you go to a supermarket or when you go to a restaurant. Um, when you wrote Rock Your Midlife, how long did it take you to write it? And how did you create this wonderful book? Well, it took me about six months to actually sit down and do the writing. So this is my fifth book, but the first as the midlife whisperer about midlife. Um, I've been thinking about it for a long time. So I started out with a mind map, which if you're thinking like about writing a book, it's a great thing to do. Where you just take a big piece of paper and you just write everything you can think about about the topic. So I just really for days just wrote down, poured all my thoughts onto a sheet of paper. And then I took that paper and I turned the paper into an outline. 
uh, with, you know, sections and chapters and sort of, you know, I've been working with women at midlife pretty much for 30 years, for my whole career. So I had a sense of my system that I work with, with people came up really, um, isolated the seven steps, yeah. thought about various stories that went along with each of the steps and then just sat down and wrote, had an editor and, uh, finished sure. the book. Wonderful. Just briefly, could you uh, go through briefly the seven steps to give our listeners an idea of what they will be able to explore with you when they get your book? Sure. And I will say, too, that I have had 20 somethings, 30 something, 70, 80, 90 somethings tell me that the book is applicable. So whatever if you feel like, oh, I don't feel like I'm quite at midlife. The, the steps are definitely applicable for anybody. Well, so I'm the first thing that's midlife. Yeah. I'm approaching 80 this year. <laughs> well, well, you look fabulous. So the, the first step, which I'm sure you have in spades, is authenticity. Okay. Just got to be yourself. The second step is to love yourself. So first, know yourself, love yourself. Third step is energize yourself. That's all about taking care of your body, your physical okay. well-being. Then it is um, reprogram your brain. So that's the neuroplasticity piece of really getting your mind, I'm sure, the positivity piece that you know so much about. The fourth, I'm sorry, the, the uh, fifth step is to empower yourself, to find power from within. Uh -huh. The sixth step is to rehab your relationships because once you start being that butterfly and you're authentic and you're loving yourself, people still think you're the caterpillar. They don't see you in the new light. So you need to know how do I relate to people, especially for those recovering people pleasers out there oh. and, you know, setting boundaries, those kinds of things. And the last piece is to enlighten yourself, to really have your connection with your God, higher consciousness, finding your meaning and purpose in life, making a difference in the world. So those are the steps in a nutshell. Okay, great. I've written those down. And for all of our listeners, uh, you can get the book or you can go back and re-listen and write these down yourselves. Uh, enlightenment. Now that I feel is uh, the spiritual aspect that we have to embrace. And it's been difficult for so many people during these difficult times to be spiritual. Uh, how do you help people with enlightenment? Well, initially I have people take a look at, you know, how you grew up. So a lot of people I find midlife are looking for meaning and purpose. Sometimes you might want to go back to the spirituality of your youth or maybe discover something that seems to resonate with you. But the bottom line of spirituality is really finding meaning and purpose in your life. So some people can feel like going out into nature is the way that they connect with spirituality. Some people might find it on a yoga mat or a meditation cushion. So really helping people figure out like what spiritual tools and practices work for me. Some people love to read spiritual literature or listen to music. And also really trying to help people connect with what their purpose is because everybody has a purpose in life. And so I help people, this is part of that first step of authenticity, of getting to know yourself understanding what are my core values? What do I really stand for? When I get to the end of my life, what do I want my life to have been about? And thinking also about what are my strengths? What am I awesome at? And maybe you are the, the best crocheter or you make the best cupcakes in the world, or you're just a really good listener, or, you know, you are super compassionate or you like to drive people or whatever, whatever that is, or maybe you're a gardener and you share your produce with people thinking about, God, what do I love to do? You know, when I was five or six years old, what did I want to be when I grew up? So there's sort of this connection, sort of the two, the step one, authenticity, knowing yourself and in, enlightening yourself, a kind of like bookends. You have to know yourself and who you are and how God shows up to you. You know, maybe it, for you, yep. maybe it is, you know, the God of your upbringing, or maybe it is some, you know, you don't even believe in like a, a God, God, you think about consciousness source. Part of it too is, is getting really quiet when asking these questions, you know, asking mm -hmm. spirit to show up and see who shows up. So notice what teachers books you're connecting with your own intuition. So it's, I think, but the, the big piece is, Understanding that you aren't just a human, you know, with a spirit, but you are a soul in a human body. You're having a human experience and you're here for a reason. And I think all of us 
are here to make a difference in the world. I think we're living in very exciting, pivotal times. I think that, you know, as women, the you know, Dalai Lama says the Western woman is going to save the world. And I think that, you know, we we're here, and I think whether you know you identify midlife or not, we are so influential. We influence, you know, our kids, our grandkids, our peers, our parents, and we are so powerful. So the spiritual piece is really owning your light, owning your power and yes. connecting with your intuition about what are you here to do to make a difference in the world? Wonderful. You know, when we come back, we're going to talk about the U-shaped happiness curve with Dr. Albertson. But right now I'm asking, have you ever met someone who was unforgettable? Well, I'd like to share with you some of my most memorable guests. Have you ever met someone who was unforgettable? Someone who has touched your heart and soul? People who have faced difficult problems? People who have struggled to find solutions? People who fearlessly shared their stories? People who have not only informed you, but inspired you? People who have priceless personalities? I have been fortunate to host an internet radio talk show called January Jones Sharing Success Stories, and it has been my privilege to interview hundreds of guests. My guests have shared their stories, their struggles, their secrets, and their successes in their own words. In this book, we're talking about people dealing with problems such as incest, molestation, runaway kids, child abuse, drug abuse, polygamy, unemployment, scandal, and starting over. Then there are my guests dealing with difficult physical struggles such as blindness, cancer, and birth defects that are beyond traumatic. My guests have all been exciting, eclectic, and energizing. They have amazed, amused, and even astonished me. I have adored getting to meet them, and I adore sharing them with you. Attention all listeners, Priceless Personalities, Success Stories Shared by January Jones, Volume 2 is now available at Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle editions. You'll be able to meet 10 amazing people who will be sharing their own personal stories with all their struggles, successes, and solutions sprinkled with lots of humor and hope. Priceless Personalities features a teenager who becomes one of the famous Supremes from Motown, a nurse who has a humorous helps people to heal, an inspiring laughter yoga instructor, a mother dealing with the loss of a child, an incredible motivational speaker, a woman who married five times, a gifted paranormal nurse, a wise economist, a funny female humorist, along with an older man sharing his sweet childhood in the deep south. January's guests are all amazing and amusing. You will never forget meeting them. Go to Amazon.com for your own priceless experience. Welcome back. Today, we're with another priceless personality, Dr. Alan Albertson. Now, I want to talk about what you refer to as the U-shaped happiness curve. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Sure. Well, the U-shaped happiness curve shows that happiness actually dips at around age 48. And this has been studied across 138 different countries. So the, wow. that's the bad news is we, you know, we think about this uh, midlife crisis and midlife is a difficult time. You know, we are dealing with elderly parents and we're dealing with teenagers. We may be going through divorce, their financial pressures. You know, women certainly are going through menopause. Men are having, you know, their own issues. So we're going through a lot of physiological, psychological changes, maybe feeling like, I don't feel like myself. I don't really know myself in a way. It's a very confusing sort of chrysalis time. I've worked with thousands of people at midlife and no, it's difficult. So the research really backs this up across many, many nations. There is this U-shaped happiness curve that dips in our mid late forties. But the good news is that it bounces back. So okay. when we can really make the most of our upswing, and that's one of the reasons I wrote Rock Your Midlife is I wanted to give people specific tools and also, you know, share that this is normal. I think that one of the one of the uh, key components of the self compassion that I talk about a lot in Rock Your Midlife is called common humanity, which is this idea that everybody struggles, everybody goes through things. So often when we're going through difficulties in our life, whether again that's empty nest, divorce, health menopause, financial in, in, issues, COVID-19, all of those things. We think it's just me. 
And I'm here to say, no, COVID-19 happened to all of us, right? Yeah. Millions of women every year go into menopause. You know, many of us are struggling with empty nest or teenagers and elderly parents. So you don't feel that you're so alone. So if you're struggling right now with midlife, know that it's an opportunity to hit pause as we talked about, you know, with COVID-19 yeah. to hit pause, to reevaluate where you're at and, and see what really lights you up. Like for me, I was feeling like I was, I was such a people pleaser. I was doing everything to please everybody else. I was trying to like bend mm -hmm. myself in the pretzel to do what society thought was right or other people thought were right. And then, you know, I went through this midlife transformation myself and started really tapping into what makes me happy? Who mm -hmm. makes me happy? How do I want to spend my life? What do I want to be doing? So there is this, this drop, but the good news is that there is a rebound. And I think part of that is also that we go from, in our, you know, the first 25 years of our life, we are learning, right? And learning and growing. Then the next 25 is kind of fame and fortune. And then we go through this next 25 years or so of giving back, of thinking about, who am I? How do I want to make a difference in the world? What really brings me joy and meaning in my life? You know, and so many women feel so overwhelmed when they hit that midlife uh, crisis. And I went through it. And I know a lot of women are going through it right now as we speak. One of the things that was helpful to me, and I'm sure you will agree with this, is I had some really close girlfriends friends and no judgment, uh, unconditional love. You know, if you were going to go out and kill your husband, they'd help you bury the body, you know, those kind of friends. Yeah. <laughs> and having women that you can reach out to women or men, it goes both ways, really having good friends is uh, such a gift, such a treasure. And as I look back on my life, I'm now coming up on 80. Wow. What a help it is. And you need Friendships don't just happen. Hey, guys, you have to work at it. You have to put a lot into friendship. Don't you agree, doctor? Yes, I agree that friendships are so incredibly important. And I find uh, the midlife women that I work with, when they get out of that, especially the school age years, right? So they're not like at the PTA meetings, PTO meetings. They're not, you know, at the soccer, at the music recitals it can get a little lonely and you do have to work on it. What I usually tell women to do is find activities that you really enjoy. So whether that is like doing a meetup group, going hiking, going to yoga class and getting in, also getting in touch with old friends. You know, we've got this great thing called Facebook. So connecting with old friends, but as you said, January, it's, you have to invest the time and it is so worth it, but you don't need to have 15 amazing friends. Yeah. Really just having even two or three good friends, you know, in addition, it's great to have a supportive partner and then to have an, a couple of other friends, as you said, that will bury the body for you. I love that. But that, you know, those, those women, those, those friends that you have to some necessarily be female, but those people in your life who love you unconditionally, who get you, who yeah, see yeah. you as you are and are supportive there and that you're, you know, supportive in return. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The non-judgmental friends. It's been fun with Facebook because I have reconnected. I went to an all girl Catholic school in Detroit, Michigan. And now after 60 some years, we're all reconnecting on Facebook. And wow, it's amazing because these are totally non judgmental people. They love you no matter what you do. It's uh, very inspiring. Before we go, I have a question I always ask all my guests. Now, if you could have dinner or lunch with any person uh, besides me, living <laughs> or dead, who would you choose to dine with? Oh gosh, such a great question. You know, I think I would love to meet the Dalai Lama just because, you know, his energy is so infectious and so incredible. And I think just connecting with him would just be amazing and life-changing. He's just such a beautiful human. So I think that's, that's who comes to mind initially. I think a lot of literary figures, it would be great to meet, but I think, yeah, I would love to meet the Dalai Lama. You know, I'm happy to share that one time uh, we were airline family. My husband was an airline pilot. And one time I was on a flight and he, Dalai Lama, came on the flight. Oh, well. Uh, the man just glowed. <laughs> 
it wasn't like he even had to say anything. He just radiated uh, peace, love, spirituality. And I, I agree with you. He'd be a fabulous dinner partner. Well, it's time for us to close this wonderful interview. And I hope it's helped a lot of you get ready for 2023 and give some thought to how you're going to approach. And I think you couldn't have a better guide than Dr. Ellen Albertson. I'm so pleased to have had you on the show with us today. And I'm so pleased to have been able to share you with everyone. Thank you. My upcoming guests will all be exciting and energizing, just like Dr. Ellen. Next Tuesday at 2 p.m., Tony Markowski from Callista Publishing will be with us, and he'll give us some tips on getting your book published and maybe just finishing your book, writing it. <laughs> now for my 79-year-old, almost 80 thought for the day. If you wait long enough to cook dinner, then everyone will just go ahead and eat cereal. <laughs> just like Seinfeld did in his show. Now this is a proven scientific fact. So there you go. Happy 2023. Thank you for entering the no wine zone and share our stories and our show with everyone you know. Remember, this year, this coming year, stop whining and start smiling. And if that doesn't work, then you can start eating chocolate, lots and lots of chocolate. Take care, stay safe until we meet again. Goodbye, Dr. Ellen, and Happy New Year 2023. We want to thank you for listening to January Jones Sharing Success Stories. Always remember Ms. Jones' personal mantra, if you can think it, you can do it. That's what all of our guests have done with their lives, and so can you. You are the ultimate success coach in your own life. All you need to do will be to start sharing your own story with your family and friends. We hope that our guest stories will encourage you to explore an equation in your future that will combine your creativity, plus connecting with others will enable you to be successful too. Always remember, your passion plus your purpose will equal prosperity as you explore the wonderful world of January Jones.